Musica! You're going to like this one. These are some of the handiest types of firearms around. Initially, when you look at things like this, you think they're just kind of like novelties, uh, things that, uh, you know, like kids would play around with sort of back in the day. Um, but these things were incredibly handy. And uh, you're going to be surprised what... Uh, who these things were actually uh, supplied to, but let's uh, let's do a little history here on these. So the Savage Model Twenty Four. Uh, it's an over under combination gun manufactured by Savage Arms. Uh, the basic model of this gun is twenty two long rifle over four ten gauge, which is what this guy is. This guy is a, considered the basic. Seven pounds, 24 inch barrels, overall length of 41 inches. And it is uh, considered a takedown, like most of these break actions. We'll do a little break action takedown in a little while, get instantly demonetized just for taking it apart. Oh, by the way, don't know why, but my tabletop, my Ithaca Model 37 tabletop video demonetized. The hell happened there? All I did was talk about the thing and shout out loads and unloads. I mean, couldn't be a clearer case of me not taking a gunner apart or showing how to manufacture it. I don't know how arbitrary these uh, decisions are. And then every time you post a video and you say, well, there's no reason this should be demonetized, they ask you yourself to like police yourself at first. So I'm like, yeah, I'm being honest. I, I, there's no reason it doesn't break any of the rules. But then they come back and tell me, like, oh, no, 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 we had to demonetize this. And that's, it's not really like a strike against you, but it makes them, like, trust you less when you post a video, let's say. So they only scrutinize your next videos more. And apparently when you start getting on a track like that, they, you know, they just start, like, arbitrarily demonetizing. And again, not to get off on a tangent here, but the, demonet the demonetization doesn't bother me as much as... The fact that they bury the videos when they're demonetized. Like, they don't promote it at all. They don't suggest it to anybody that they think would be interested in it. And it just uh, hurts the community. It hurts to build the gun tubers community here uh, on YouTube when they when they do that. Well, anyway, it is what it is. I'm going to keep going. I am not going to give up. So, the Savage Model 24... Uh, introduced by Stevens originally in 1938. There's a little contention with that. I think there's a 37 thrown around in some places or a 39, but we'll just go with 38. That's what I read the most, uh, most of the time. Um, and they are right before the war. So believe it or not here, I'll just get this out of the way quick, who I was saying these things were given to. During World War II, there's a lot of literature saying that the United States Army Air Corps purchased some 15,000 of these as survival guns, all right? So I tried to really poke around and do, like, research to get an actual confirmation on that, and it's very difficult. I don't think they were legal. I think that's why. I You know, they were a lot of, like, rules for war, like, you know, back then or whatever, and, you know, there's a lot of things that we use that you really weren't allowed to... Something about, like, 22s. I think that's what it was, was the 22 part. Um, and it had something to do with, like, even there's some 22 pistols that were used by, like, uh, you know, OSS for, like, these, like, uh, you know, assassination-y kind of things and stuff like that, suppressed 22 handguns, and they couldn't even have U.S. property marks on them because I think it was just something about the 22 round that, for some reason, and as, as benign as the 22 is, that's weird, but... It wasn't, um, like, a, uh, for some reason, it wasn't allowed to be used as a uh, war weapon, let's say. So I think that's why they had to be kind of quiet about it. But I did read uh, in a few different sources say that these were used uh, for that reason. 
So that was uh, Stevens making them back then. It was called the 22410. That was the, the model 22410. Wonder where they come up with those numbers, right? But um, that was a very accurate name for it. Um, and then sat, in 1950, Stevens stopped making them, and Savage introduced it as the model 24. Now, all of that doesn't really make any sense at all because Savage bought Stevens back in 1920. So way before this thing was ever even on the drawing board, it was Savage all along. I mean, Savage owned Stevens back then. Um, it was only really called as Stevens, I guess, by name. But, uh, I mean, who knows? Maybe that whole Stevens division was run by different people, so it was separate. I mean, who knows? But um, it really was all kind of like under the same umbrella. Uh, so under the years of production... Um, these things had several different, uh, monikers here. They were called the 24, which is this one. There was a 24B, a C, an SE, a V. All right. So there were, yeah, I, I, I would really bore you sitting here telling you like each possible configuration and what the letters were. Um, if you own one of them, then, you know, you could post in the comments, say, Hey, I got a V. This is what mine is. But, um, Basically, all you need to know is that the uppers were chambered for a 22 long rifle like this one, but you could also get it in 22 Winchester Magnum rimfire, which is interesting. We just did that 922 Magnum, that Marlin series, the three uh, video series where I refurbished the buddy's gun, fixed the uh, buffer that was in it. Um, I mean, that gun was, what was it, 1990? When did that one come out? I think I had it written here. That one debuted in 94 and was around until 2001. So that round had been around for a long time. But believe it or not, that round, that Winchester Magnum rim, Rimfire round, this was the first long gun um, chambered in it. And it was 90, where's, the, I have that date somewhere. It was, uh, I think it was 1959. So this is a 58, actually. This is a 58, so the very next year, this was the first long gun. There were a couple of pistols in 58 um, when this first came out, when that round uh, first came out in 59, sorry. There were a couple of pistols that were chambered in it, but uh, no long guns. This was the first long gun, so I guess it was 60, and I'll see if I have it. If I go ahead here, I'll see if I actually run into it in my notes the exact year. But uh, that's interesting. There's a tie-in right there with the uh, with that Marlin. Is that uh, that interesting round was um, Winchester itself didn't even have anything to. They didn't chamber anything in it when it first came out. And you know, Savage came along and did. Um, so the the uppers. I'm sorry. Twenty two long rifle. Twenty two Winchester Magnum rimfire. Twenty two Hornet. Two twenty two Remington. Two twenty three Remington. Thirty thirty Winchester. 357 Magnum and 357 Max. This, of course, wasn't all through the years, like right away. Right away, not. You know, so when in when Savage, uh, when Stevens came out with this thing in, uh, in the 30s, uh, they obviously didn't have, you know, all of those, uh, all of those chamberings, you know what I mean? Um, in 38. But through the years, this is where this thing has gone. And the bottom, I'm sorry, the bottom was uh, much easier, uh, Just it was just 410, 20 gauge, or 12 gauge, defending, depending on the configuration. Now, there were some weird ones. Listen to this weird, this, I got one odd one here. There was one called a 240. This is when Stevens debuted this rifle in 38. There was a 240, which was an over-under 410, 410. Double 410, over-under over 410s. Both 3-inch... Uh, chambers, both full chokes. Uh, they had two triggers and two hammers. Okay, and uh, from the literature I have here, um, they had double triggers and two separate narrow hammers, each powered by a separate mainspring fitted into the space occupied by the single hammer on the 22410 version. It was not as useful nor as popular as the combination gun. It was discontinued in 1941 at the beginning of World War I, well, World War II. They're rarely, rarely seen today. 
So that one, if you're into rarity, they only made that one for a few years at the very beginning, Stevens, and it's a 410 over 410, model 240. If you find one of those, you should grab it. Um, there was also Savage made a 242, which was kind of like similar. I guess they tried to reintroduce that Savage. It was uh, same thing, two four ten barrels, three inch full chokes. They made it from seventy seven to eighty one. So don't get confused if you're looking for the collectible one, the two forty two from Savage. While that might be cool and even a little rare, they only made that for uh, four years. But um, that super rare Stevens one, the two forty, with the double triggers, and uh, the hammer split in two. That's the guy that uh, that's the guy that you're looking for. If if rarity is your uh, is your bag. So what else do we have here? Uh, let's continue with our information. Uh, so yeah, this there's a um, the Stevens ones and the early Savages. This would be considered, I guess, an early Savage. Uh, they Savage put them out in fifty. This is a fifty. Eight. Um, they had an exposed hammer, and there's a barrel selector on the side here. This switch up and down. So if you want to fire the upper, the 22, you have the switch in the upper position. You cock the hammer, and you're firing. You're hitting. It's interesting how they actually do that. If you can see in here, this switch actually just moves where that there's like a block between the firing pin and the hammer the firing pins the, so each barrel has its own firing pin and this selector just slides up and down kind of like a button that strikes either the upper or the lower firing pin pretty cool huh so um supposedly these didn't last long they broke i mean i'm fully prepared for mine to break i mean if it does um, they say that you could retrofit. What they did as a retrofit was, hopefully I could find some kind of picture that I could throw it up here for you. The uh, fix that Stevens did, sorry, that Savage did, was they made it, you just remove this mechanism completely. You remove this button and the mechanism inside. And all you got to do is replace the hammer. And the hammer itself had a toggle on it where you would be able to either toggle it where it was striking the upper or the lower barrel just by flipping a switch on the hammer. And supposedly, you could retrofit that right into these, and the only thing that you would have is like a hole on the side of the gun here that didn't do anything. Um, if there was a, So Savage would take these in for repair. They wouldn't even repair what was broken here. They just made a simpler design with a hammer that you, had a, that you flipped on the hammer. And, um, and that was it, so... I've, I've even seen that they do sell, I've seen a couple of places where I've just seen that hammer for sale. So the, this switch might not, uh, this one seems to be fine. <laughs> this gun doesn't look like, it looks like it's been used quite a bit, you know, and uh, the switch seems okay. So I guess I just got lucky. Um, see what else we got here. The Savage Model 42 was introduced in 2012. It's like a successor was uh, 20 inch barrels um and then there was a 2400 made by valmet of finland imported by savage from 75 to 80. there was a savage model 389 made from 88 to 90. but uh let's just stick with this basic configuration with the model 24 even the model 24 has different variations where the barrels were separated from each other there's a lot a lot going on there definitely enough going on there to um to just stick with those just for this video let's say so um we'll just like stick with the old school and uh they may i mean they made these all the way up to 2010 so that's quite a run right there you know what i mean yeah that's that certainly is so um these things, let's show the operation, right? They open here with a top lever that can be pushed in either direction, right? And uh, they bra they're brake action. They have an extractor, a cam-operated extractor here on the bottom. 
and a plunger type here on the top for the 22 barrel. Okay, so let's see. We got some uh, inert stuff we could load in here. So just to show you, we could throw in a uh, spent 410 shell. So that's how it, uh, sorry about that. That's how it sits right there. And the uh, 22, same thing. It sits right on that extractor right there. And uh, these work really well, like when you, uh, then every time you close it, you have to cock the hammer before firing it. So there's no external safety. It's kind of like the safety is really just that you have to cock the hammer before <laughs> before uh, it's ready to go every single time. And uh, it's nice. It leaves just enough of the rim out here. I actually shot around the trap with this, basically just to test its function. It's actually cheaper to shoot around the trap than to just take a trip to the range just to see if it works with, you know, <laughs> like that. So um, I, I shot around the trap and I got a one. I actually only hit one clay with it. And I think it had to do with the fact that these sights were not, I mean, I was trying all over the place. I was like, am I going over it, under it? I was trying to figure out. Then I realized I was shooting way, way under it because I think these sights were made more for like, you know, like the rifle part of it. So it's like, I, I think I aimed way over it and, and hit one, but then I, it was towards the end of the game. And I, but then when I finally found that I had like, maybe might've been the last station, the first shot in the last station or one of the last shots in the second to last station. And then in the last station, I tried to duplicate that and I, I couldn't, but, uh, let's see what else we got here. Let's show the, uh, buttstock, the, the, uh, the buttstock, the forend here, the forend removal. Let me zoom out just a touch here. The forend removal with these is so cool. You just get like a good grip on here, like some good leverage. And you just pop it right off. It's that simple. They just pop right out with this really cool spring-loaded thing that hooks in here like that. Pretty cool. And then um, you break it in half at this point, like most uh, break-action guns. You'll just be able to separate them right there like that. And that's how cool these things are. Nice and uh, easy for transport. Uh, stowing away somewhere. Some of these... Um, some of these actually had places inside the stock for storing ammo. Like they might have had a cap that comes off here where you could store ammo in the stock. These older ones like this didn't, but there were certain versions that did. And uh, we could take a look in here. Pretty simple, right? I mean, these are, uh, these are great guns. There's not much that can break here. You know what I mean? These things are solid. And then it's as simple as you really have to make sure you have this perfectly lined up straight. And then it'll just clip right back in. Comes apart real quick. Very handy, you know? Very handy. And, uh... So there's a little more information here that I'm reading about the 22WMR um savage jumped on that round apparently when it was released in 59 um i have here what it was chambered in it was chambered in ruger's single six revolver and smith and wesson's k22 masterpiece and that was it there were no 22 winchester magnum rimfire rifles supposedly they're saying that it was because all existing designs were made for a long rifle. They were all too short. But because this was a break-open design, cartridge length didn't matter. So that's why Savage just jumped on the, on the round and was like, you know, we're using it immediately. We don't have to redesign anything. So uh, that was cool. You didn't see any other guns, any other long guns coming out uh, chambered in that until uh, 1960. Now, around the time when this one was made in 58, Around this time, I don't have an exact year, but this, this might very well be the first year because in some places I see where they say 1960, but this one has it. There's a 3 8 inch um, dovetail um, created here. 
for a scope. You cut two grooves in here. It's pretty cool, right? So if, you, if for some reason you wanted to scope this thing, you would be able to. So in the late 60s, early 70s, it started changing. It was taking on like a new character. Um, mono, block breaching, separated barrels, 12 gauge guns, plastic stocks, camouflage coats, center fire cartridges for the rifle barrel. Um, the It started just changing what they were all about. But um, these early ones in 22 and 410, uh, these are, in my opinion, this is what the heart of, uh, you know, these were all about. It was just all about being kind of like a handy survival gun. So some literature here I have, uh, my Cartridges of the World um, book by Frank C. Barnes. Let's uh, go even here. We'll take a little, we'll take a look here. The 22 Winchester Magnum Rimfire. You see, they were putting WRM in that last article I was reading. I got to remember, it's Winchester Magnum Rimfire is the correct way to describe this round. It's not Winchester Rimfire Magnum. Although that wasn't my fault. I was just reading it out of an article, but um, but I did see the mistake. I, I didn't correct myself. Um, so uh, even in here, they're saying Ruger and Smith and Wesson advertised revolvers for this new round before the end of '59, and Savage chambered their Model 24, a 22-410 over/under combination gun for the Magnum rimfire shortly thereafter. Um, it was the Winchester Model 61 was the first Winchester uh, rifle chambered. Uh, for it pretty cool right um so it's it uh has a place in history just for that being the first uh gun to be chambered in that and then uh let's we're having fun with this 1970 annual lately let's stick there who would think with that with the extensive library i have on gun books that i keep referring back to this uh 1970 catalog but it's awesome so here's a couple. I mean, this is, if you want to do your research, this is how you would find out. What was a Savage Model 24D? All right, so here's the D. The bottom barrel you could get for the D were 20 gauge and 410, top barrel calibers, 22 long rifle, 22 magnum rimfire. There's a 24 inch barrel, visible hammer, selective single trigger. So uh, uh, here, Monte Carlo stock and forearms. See, like, so bang, right there. You go like, oh, I don't see any difference between the 24. Oh, D could be just the Monte Carlo stock. I see checkering on here. See, there's no checkering here. This is very basic, just the 24. But here, maybe this D added some checkering here, some scrolling I think I see on the side. There you go. Down here on the bottom, excuse me, we have the Savage Model 24V. Bottom barrel gauge, 20... 20 gauge only. Top is 222 Remington only. So there you go. That's what the V is. The V is 222 Remington over 20 gauge. And uh, everything else the same. But Monte Carlo stock, the checkering, same deal. And uh, so you do your research, poke around the different... They, they made so many different ones. I, I would have... Uh, my brain would have been on fire trying to, like, figure out every single possible combination. Then, uh, of course, I promised you, here's the Savage book. Wait, there was something in here in the Savage book, obviously. The very popular Savage Model 24 combination gun, which is perfect as a pest or meat gun. <laughs> Available in 22 long rifle 20 gauge, 22 long rifle 410, also 22 magnum rimfire, and same shot gauges, 222 rem, 3030 slash 20, or 3030 over 20 gauge. So uh, it there's a, you know, this is this book is so all over the place that it's tough to even, you know, it's like a page here and a page there, you find information on it. But I did promise you. I just want, I did promise you some information on Savage, all right? I'm going to go through this real quick because uh, this is, uh, this is crazy. 
This guy's life was crazy. But I did promise you, I did a little bit of research. And uh, I'm going to go through it real quick. This is why it's insane. Listen to this now. This is Arthur William Savage, the uh, senior, all right? Born 1857 in Kingston, Jamaica, British West Indies. His father was British, he was Welsh. He was a special commissioner from England to the West Indies. His duty was to set up an educational system for newly freed slaves. Uh, there, there was an emancipation, and his job was to set up the educational system for them. So the kid, so his kid, you know, received a, uh, a pretty good education because he, he was an educator, you know. So I'm sure his dad took to uh, schooling him pretty good. He was schooled in Baltimore, Maryland, England. Uh, that he did extensive travel and exploration. He led a nomadic life. He explored Australia by covered wagon. He married there in 1878 to a woman named Annie Bryant. He had eight children, four bo boys, four girls. And uh, one of his sons, like, kind of stuck with him through his whole life. So, like, from here on, this, this one kid that was actually born in the covered wagon kind of stuck with him his whole life. And that was the kid that, when he died, was the guy that we know towards the 20s and the 30s and the 40s that was making all those Savage 22s that we played with and this gun and stuff like that, right? That was, like, the guy that kind of, like, uh, had the company then. Um, in Australia, okay... He was captured and held prisoner by Australian Aborigines for over a year before escaping, eventually became the owner uh, and or manager, uh, tough, to, <laughs> tough to really get a lot of this information, but uh, the owner or the, or the manager of Australia's largest cattle ranch, all right, that's a big country and there's a lot of cattle, so to be the largest cattle ranch, that's huge. After 11 years... Of doing that, he sold the ranch, returned to Jamaica, and purchased a coffee plantation. Um, now, this is when he began inventing. He started to realize that he could invent mechanical things, and it became an interest. He invented a torpedo called the Salvage Halpine Torpedo, collaborating with this guy, Halpine. It was adopted by the Brazilian Navy. And uh, the U.S. Navy tested it, and they were impressed. This was, and you hear this a lot in this guy's life. It was definitely better than the other things that were up against it, but because of political considerations that got in the way of the naval authorities adopting it. And this is the history of this guy. He was just so out of nowhere, out of left field. He wasn't like one of the boys. So it's like, it's almost like if you weren't from Win Winchester, Colt, or Remington, you know, they didn't even want to hear from you, or you'd never get a contract like that, regardless of how good your stuff was. So um, this is a common thread in this guy's life. So he, um, he moved to Utica. He became the manager, uh, superintendent of the Utica Beltline Railroad. And he began working at the Utica Magazine Hammer Company, where he started messing around with uh, gun stuff, like learning about gun things. Uh, he believed he could create a sporting arms company to compete with Colt, Remington, and uh, Winchester. In 1893, he patented, and this digs into a little bit of the history from our last video, he patented a lever-action rifle. In 1894, he started Savage Arms Company in Utica. Uh, he called the rifle his model 1895 for when he started production on it. In 1899, he made improvements on that rifle. In 1902, uh, instead of using old rented stuff or leasing the 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 places where he was had where he had the company in 1902 he bought land and built his first buildings for the Savage Arms Company, 35 acres worth 700,000 square feet manufacturing space in 1902 and was rocking and rolling from 02 to 04, uh, kicking ass in the arms manufacturing business, sold his interest. Out of Savage Arms to a group of Utica businessmen. Boom, I'm out. So to tell you the truth, this guy, what was it? 1890, 1894, he started Savage Arms. 1904, he's out. 10 years, that was it. Um, but what an impact this guy made. This, this guy could not sit still for a second. Uh, it's amazing. 
Uh, he moved to San Diego. I'm not even done here. Moved to San Diego, California at that point. Started the Savage Tire Company. Go research that. There's tire collectors that would <laughs> that would skip right over the gun stuff and get right into the tire stuff. The guy invented the radial tire. His radial tires on your car today. You know, it's that's amazing. Um, he eventually got out of that. Bought large citrus groves in California. Got out of that. Sold them to buy two oil wells. Um, and uh, took up gold mining in Northern California. Which, uh, they, those two th ventures did not make... Uh, they were big losses. They they, they hurt him. Um, and uh, I don't think he was ever really successful in those endeavors. But uh, by now he's getting old. You know what I mean? And... Uh, had something to do with the mines that were filling up with water and all kinds of stuff. Whatever it was. But this guy got sick with something. It's uh, a shame. Uh, he died by suicide because he didn't want to just wither away from whatever he had. He got some type of cancer or something like that and was dying and, uh, and uh, committed suicide. But that son, uh, Arthur John Savage... That's like the Savage that you'd hear in more modern times, which was the Savage that was around... Um, I didn't do any research on him to find out like when his father sold out of the company, if he still hung around with it, but he followed his dad through all of these other ventures of like moving to different places, buying, all, you know, buying citrus groves and all this stuff at the tire company. That son was like his right hand man, um, straight through everything and eventually became like a very good firearms designer and, um, and um inventor uh on his own and uh maybe one day we'll uh sit down and do an hour's re worth of research on that guy but i did promise i would tell you how eclectic that guy's life was and there you go i mean like i said we could do like a two-hour video just on this dude which um you know which we're not gonna do but <laughs> i just wanted to have i just wanted to give you like the the basics of this uh of this dude's life so the Model 24, very handy. It's small. It has a, like a, it's like a ramp rifle sight up here, right? These are, uh, I don't know if these are brazed together. I'd be amazed if that was cut out of one single piece of steel. That would blow my mind. How does it look over here? No, definitely not. You could see where... It's separate, I'm pretty sure, but um, nice nonetheless. Oh, what are we there? Let's read that. And a uh, plastic butt plate. Let's look at uh, some of the, what do we have written on here? 22 long rifle over here. And I suppose we're going to see what's on the bottom here. Let's zoom in a little. It always looks nice here when we zoom when we want to read. Proof tested, 410 bore, 3 inch chamber. Savage, Savage Arms Corporation, Chicopee Falls, Massachusetts. So, yeah, you saw that Savage was in Utica during the Savage 99 days. This is the Savage in Massachusetts days. So. You have like different, uh, you definitely have different eras in uh, Savage history, but uh, they made some cool stuff. They really did. They really made some cool stuff. And uh, that's that. I'll um, gonna be back with you soon. We're gonna start. We're gonna start an endeavor here, and we're gonna delve back in to uh, John Browning. John Browning and uh, his separation from Winchester. We've talked about the direction Browning went in with his A5, bringing it to Belgium. The head of Remington died, Hartley died, and he, the day he went in there to talk to him, Winchester didn't want to play ball with his royalties. So went across the ocean to Belgium, made the Remington Model 8, which uh, originally was, uh, you know, also another Belgian-produced uh, gun with the long recoil action. So he was making shotguns and rifles with that long recoil action. Very uh, top of the 
top of the gun game back then. But where, what direction did Winchester go in? That's what we're going to be delving into the next couple of weeks. So get your uh, get your Winchester hats on, number one. And we're going to be seeing what do you do when you're Winchester. Um, and, uh, and you're up against it. You can see we did the Model 50. So eventually Winchester ended up in a good place. That is a good shotgun. Um, they kind of uh, forgot about John Browning's ideas by then. <laughs> Took 50 years. But um, they started... Um, like they just started doing their own thing by then. And by using that floating chamber and everything, they were, uh, doing okay. But before that, that's that little window there before the 50, I want to explore when John Browning walked out and took his guns. What happened? What happened to Winchester as far as their automatic shotguns? What did they do? That's what we're going to be looking at. So I'll see you all later. Uh, and we'll be delving into that soon. And till then, you take care. Yes, yeah, <laughs>